Hi, everyone. Welcome to Black in Focus. I'm Karen Tuller here in New York, and we have a great show today. We are talking to Terrence Blanchard. He is a six-time Grammy-winning American trumpeteer, um, tons of albums, tons of music scores for, for film and other productions. But most importantly, he has an opera that's debuting at the Met just in a couple of days. Terrence, good to see you. Hey, thank you, Karen. Thanks for having me. Good to see you, too. This is the first opera by a Black composer in the Met's 136-year history. Yep. What took them so long? That's a good question. I mean, you know, I, you would have to ask them. You know, I just know that it's an overwhelming experience for me because I know I'm not the only one that was qualified throughout that 136-year history. There have been a lot of great composers who have come before me. William Grant still being one of them. And uh, I'm just standing on some very broad shoulders, man. And I'm blessed to be where I am, but I'm I'm doing whatever I can to make sure that I don't let all of those folks down. Fire's um, a very complex story of identity and childhood trauma. Um, mm -hmm. Is part of the stumbling block with the traditional sense of what opera is, what opera should sound like, what the story should be? The biggest hurdle is being confident in our skin. You know, um, that's the main thing, because there has been this type of approach of saying that opera should be a certain thing. And I'm not necessarily a believer in that. You know, I think opera has always tried to tell stories. And when you look at the great composers throughout history, especially, you know, the romantic composers that most of us listen to, those tales were taken from the community from which they were created, you know. And I think it's time for, you know, composers, and there are a lot of composers who are doing that. Let me just say that I'm not the only one. There are a lot of composers who are writing contemporary works. It's mostly the concert halls that have to put on the productions. Um, when we were in uh, New Orleans with my first opera, Champion, which is about a fighter, there was an elderly gentleman, African-American man who was in his mid seventies who came up to me and he said, if this is opera, I'll definitely come. And I know the reason for that is because he saw himself on the stage, you know, and that's what's important to me about being in this world is bringing our culture and our history to this forum. How much of it at, at a place like uh, like the Met is it is it also the donors? I think the Met has like a $300 million a year operation. I think it's mm -hmm. the largest um, cultural institution in, in America. Um, are the donors where you are? Are the donors um, happy to support um, new works, different works? I mean, I think so. I mean, the few donors that I've met, obviously the ones that I've met are very supportive of what it is that we're doing. But my whole point about this is I don't want to be a token. I want to be the turnkey. You know, I want this mm -hmm. to open the doors for a lot of other people, not just African-Americans, but women and all people of different races and backgrounds, because there are a lot of stories that can be told, you know, in this forum. And it's a great organization, man. I'm telling you, you just finished a rehearsal with the orchestra and they were amazing, you know, just simply amazing. And the voices were amazing as well. So you grew up immersed in music. I mean, you are from New Orleans, but your father, I believe, was a manager with an insurance company, but he also was a part-time opera singer. Your, your childhood yeah. friends were Wenton and Brand. Uh, Brantford, uh, you picked up the trumpet and, and piano when you were still in single digits. But most importantly, perhaps, um, you went to performing arts high school. Um, there's a report out um, from um, Save the Music that says that music programs in underserved communities are often the first to kind of get cut. How important is that early, those early stages? You said getting comfortable in your skin, having kids have music education, however they can get it. Well, I think it's extremely important. It's not just music, but it's arts in general. You know, I think a lot of kids that grow up in our society sometimes can't find a way to uh, communicate. They can't find a way to fit in. And one of the things that art will allow them to do is to find their voice, you know, find their path. The school was called NOCA, New Orleans Center for the Creative Arts. When I went to NOCA, you know, um, they were talking about budget cuts and everything and NOCA was always the first thing that they wanted to cut. But it was also very interesting to me that when the Chinese ambassador came to New Orleans, NOCA was the first place they sent him to go see what was happening in New Orleans public schools. You know, so you can't have it both ways. You know, I think 
it's really important when you look at the success of Wendell Pierce, Wynton Marcellus, Branford Marcellus. I mean, the list is endless. Harry Connick. Those are people that I just went to school with at this high school in my generation. And there's so many others. Anthony Mackey, you know, uh, those have all been very productive people who have come from arts high schools, which is a public school in New Orleans. And they've gone on to do a lot of great things and not only in the world of art, but also in the community. You also score um, for film. You, you did Spike Lee's tw- four hour Hurricane Katrina doc. You have New York um, NYC epicenters coming up, I guess, this fall as well. Is part of what's fueling perhaps more more uh, need for, for music, just the growth of, of all, all the streaming services and you have Ava and Oprah and, you know, Shonda um, and Tyler um, just co- pumping out more and more content. They, content. they all need creative people. Um, mm-hmm. How important do you think that is in kind of building up that pipeline? Well, it's extremely important because, you know, like you said, there, there's so many streaming services. But the, the thing is, we can't just put out anything in any type of content and think that it's worthy of being on those services. You know, we still have to add, 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 uh, aspire to a high level of excellence, you know, which has been the history in our community. I'm proud of people like Chris Bowers. It inspires me, you know, and I look at him and some other people John Baptiste, who, you know, won the Oscar this year. Um, I look at all of these young folks and I go, you know, all of this is worth it, you know, because we're expanding the palette. We are broadening out and giving a lot of other people a shot at, at, at entering into this world of creativity. You just released Absinthe, <laughs> yes. um, a tribute to a saxophonist, Wayne Shorter. Um, mm-hmm. What's the difference between creating an album and, 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 and put, giving birth to an opera? Is it is it two different parts of your brain? How does that work? Well, I, you know, it's, I, don't, I wouldn't say it's two different parts of your brain, but, you know, the album is a collaborative effort with, with the guys in the band and myself. I write some things, they'll write some things, you know, mm-hmm. and then we come together and we kind of arrange everything and we, we, we kind of start with a concept and go from there. The opera is, you know, it's like making a movie for me, you know, but the thing is, I'm the one that starts with the movies. The movies are done and then they bring them to me and I score them. Yeah. With an opera, it starts and ends with me. So it's a lot of work. It took me two years to write, you know, this opera. The end result is so rewarding, you know, to hear these beautiful voices and to see the lighting and the staging and the orchestra. There's so many moving parts, but then when it comes together in a live setting, it's just a miraculous thing to experience. And I've been telling people, I say, you have to stop using the word opera sometimes because people get jaded by that term. Just like when sometimes you say jazz, people think of a certain thing, you know, but I, I've been telling people this is the highest form of, of musical theater that I've ever experienced. So for, you know, we've seen with other, with plays and, and other types of performances that when, when there's a black creative involved, a lot of people come, people from the community come, other people come, but the point is that a lot of people come who may not traditionally go to this highest form of musical theater, um, who may not usually go to the opera. For people who may not go often or people who are specifically like me, obstructed views going to see um see you on uh, on opening night which is such a treat um what should what, what attitude should we bring when we're when we're when we're sitting there and, and taking in the performance i think the main thing is to empty your mind you know don't come to it with any preconceived notions because i think those are the things that set you up for failure you know i think if you if you keep an open mind and just allow yourself to be absorbed in it because it is a different experience. It's not like going to a concert where you have amplified voices all over the place. These are natural voices singing in a theater and then start to assess what you've experienced later. You know, um, um, I did that when I was first commissioned by Opera Theater St. Louis years ago. I was really inspired to be a part of that community. You tore yourself away from rehearsals to talk with us today. We really appreciate it. Congratulations on Absence and congratulations on this opera. And that's going to do it for this edition for Black in Focus. I'm Karen Chula. Next week, we'll be joined by the co-president and chief marketing and design officer for Savage by Fenty right after their show. So we'll see you then. Have a great day, everyone. Take care. Bye-bye.